Hey, welcome to the Sermonary Podcast. I am your host, Josh Taylor, and I'm here with my guest and my uh, good friend, Jack Hester. Jack Hester is the lead pastor and teaching pastor at Mars Hill Church in both Mobile, Alabama, and you guys have a campus in Fairhope, Alabama. Right. This is actually the church that I was on staff at uh, for roughly 10 years, uh, working as worship leader and then executive pastor. So you and I worked well together for many years and, uh, and, and accomplished a lot of fun things that we have no idea how we did it. Um, yeah. People would ask us, you know, how did you guys pull off what you did? at Mars Hill and we would always answer we have no idea it's got it's got to be the Lord because we're just two knuckleheads that had no idea what we were doing that's and, right uh, I mean how many years did we work together uh I guess 10 11 years something like yeah. that and it was probably two of my best years in ministry yeah <laughs> thank you appreciate it uh, <laughs> I'm but one kidding. of the things that, awesome. that, yes. that, that you've been able to do really well in your leadership is build a team of highly capable people and you just trusted them to do what they were good at. Uh, you knew where your strengths were, you knew where your weaknesses were, and you built a team that could um, really, their strengths were where your weaknesses were. So you trusted them enough to kind of let them do it. You weren't a micromanager and, um, and you had a vision and you hired people that could help you execute that vision uh, for the church there in, in, in lower Alabama. And I benefited from that and I was able to be a part of that and, and loved that structure. And I think it's one of the reasons why we're, you were able to create a culture of what we're gonna be talking about today. And that's really pastors finding opportunities to rest, uh, to be able to take care of themselves. But before we jump into that, you also did your PhD in leadership and you're, tell, tell me again, your, your dissertation was specifically about um, pastors uh, burning out and the burnout rate of pastors. But tell me exactly what your dissertation was about, because that's what we're going to be talking about today. Yeah, so it was about longevity in ministry is, in essence, what it was about. It was looking at the phenomenon of burnout, which is really not a phenomenon because it's so common. The phenomenon was actually longevity. Um, so burnout has become very common in ministry. Matter of fact, some of the statistics I saw said the two leading occupations for burnout were nurses and pastors. That's interesting. Um, and, and usually your highest rates of burnout are going to be occupations, what we call helping occupations, people who are always helping other people. Because um, there's this process that leads to burnout. And ultimately what happens is you're, you're giving so much of yourself and there's nothing replenishing that in the end, you just, it, it's literally a mechanical term is what it started as machines that run, 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 run. And eventually their parts wear out because they run nonstop and they have to be replaced. So they started making that applicable to humans in the sense of people who kept running, 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 and eventually they would burn out literally mm -hmm. like a, like a machine, they would burn out and they would have to replenish before they could come back into it and, and be able to do anything. So what we looked at was you know, the statistics tell us that most pastors stay in their churches three to five years mm -hmm. and then they leave and go to another church. Some of them leave and get out of ministry. Um, and then some of them, uh, unfortunately, have some kind of failure that causes them to um, exit out of ministry uh, probably quicker than they would have ever imagined. Which often probably and, is a result of them not taking the necessary precautions of rest and yes. pushing themselves to the limits because I know that when we get to a point of exhaustion, we make bad decisions. That's exactly right. Yeah, um, it's, it's a multiplicity of things, but that one is probably the highest on the list is just, um, you know, not, not planning ahead, not thinking about who you are and what you're actually capable of doing and being honest about that. Yeah. Um, so anyway, in my study, what I did was I studied pastors who somehow overcame those odds and stayed in one location for at least 15 years and saw growth in their church over that period. And then I just kind of did it like a content analysis to see what were the similarities that I saw among these pastors that were able to stay. And there were a lot of things that were different that were unique to each pastor but then there were some glaring obvious commonalities mm -hmm. that all of them shared and so uh part of my dissertation the findings were kind of assimilating those those uh characteristics if you will 
and seeing maybe maybe these are something we need to pay attention to um, if we want to build longevity into the life of pastors of our churches. Yeah. So I, I want to jump into those things uh, in just a minute, because I think that that is the key, really the, the takeaway for anyone that's listening to this podcast. Uh, one of the things that I find interesting is that you you brought up both nurses and pastors of being the two occupations that probably have higher rate of burnout. And it seems to be those two occupations also work very long hours and they're very long hours of giving to other people. Um, it's, but even other people that are not their family members that are not their loved ones, uh, they're just pouring into often either strangers or, or people that they're not highly connected to um, as, uh, as, as family members and, and those kind of things. And so uh, th that is interesting to me. And I think, again, goes back to some of the findings that you found in your dissertation. So uh, you said the rate of, uh, the, or the kind of the tenure for pastors on average right now is three to five years, uh, which is, is, is sad because I think churches need leadership for, uh, often need leadership longer than that uh, to really be able to have the impact that they want to in discipleship within their community, within their cities, those kind of things the pastors get so tired so quickly and three to five years feels like a really long time, even though it's not that long. And you've been at Mars Hill really obviously since its inception um, was uh, 2006, I believe. Four. 2004. Yeah, 2004. I, I was really started. confused of what, what year it actually started, but I was in college when it started. Uh, so I guess that makes sense. So yeah, 2000, so 16 years. So you're kind of at that, um, that healthy 10 year phase of 15 to 30 years at a church. And I think you've been able to do it because you've been able to create a culture where you value rest. I know that you threatened to fire me once because I would not take my day off uh, right. during the week. I was, which, you know, I had a choice of Mondays or Fridays along with the weekend. And I was working five days a week, six days a week, sometimes seven days a week. And you knew that wasn't healthy for me. So as somebody who loved me and cared for me, as a part of your staff and as a friend, you you threatened to fire me if I wouldn't take a day off because you knew the effects of it, uh, yeah. not only for myself and my family, but also for the church. So, um, with in your in your discovery, what were kind of the, some of the problems that you were seeing that led to um, you know you, you looking into what are the successful pastors doing and what's some of the commonalities that they're doing, and we'll jump into that afterwards. But what were you seeing, obviously, with the burnout rates and those kind of things? Yeah, so it's funny. There's an old adage that says uh, the pastor who doesn't take a day off and you ask him, you know, why don't you take a day off? And he says, well, because the devil don't take a day off. Yeah. And you have to remind him that's why he's the devil is because mm -hmm. he never takes a day <laughs> off either. So it is an important thing. And it's kind of like if you're if you don't plan to take a day off and to rest, you're 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 killing yourself anyway. So uh, you're not going to last very long in ministry, or at least you're not going to be very healthy in ministry. I could say that at least. So um, these pastors, uh, I guess we can start with that. The pastors, well, you know, what, let me back up for a moment and say what I believe is wrong with the pastors that don't stay very long. There's two things. Number one, Sundays are relentless. They keep coming at you over and over and over again. And sermon preparation is very difficult. And it's something that never stops. It's kind of like, I make the analogy of, it's kind of like having a baby every week. You know, you, you have a baby, you nurture it, you take care of it, you give birth to it on Sunday, only to find out on Monday you're pregnant again. Mm -hmm. And it's just like this constant cycle that never ends. It just keeps coming at you. And you know, for some pastors that don't take time off, uh, their whole life, really their whole quiet time is centered around whatever it is that they're teaching. And that's their focus. And what happens is you get through what you learned in seminary and what you learned by listening to others and you get through it in about three years and then you don't have anything else. And yeah. so how are you going to come up with something else? Well, it's easier to go to another church and recycle what you already have. So some pastors, that's, that's their cycle is they just keep moving according to the content that they have. And I think for some other pastors, they never can get anybody to follow them. Yeah. So they come in with these visions of grandeur. They're going to make some changes. They have a fresh vision. They believe that they've, they've received this from the Lord and, and no reason to doubt them on that. But what happens is they come in and they begin to implement it and nobody will follow them and they get frustrated and they say to themselves, well, no one's ever going to follow me. It's always going to be like this. Therefore, you know, I'd be better off going to another place because those people will follow me. 
And the truth is they're just not being honest about what's happening there. That a lot of these churches, they don't follow you because the guy before you um, built a building and it was 500,000 or 2 million or $12 million. And then he left and guess yeah. what? He didn't have to pay a dime for it. So, you know, it's not well, hard to believe. Pastors that. are only staying at churches for three to five years. I mean, honestly, I think that's about the time that you need to build trust that's exactly with a community right. and family. So they're it's like, before they've even had time to build trust with them. That's it. It's like one of the pastors said that I interviewed, he said, until you marry a few of them and you bury a few of them, they're not going to see you as their pastor. It's mm-hmm. almost like you have to walk through some crises with these families before they see you as their pastor. And that takes, you know, three, five, seven years, maybe even longer, depending on how entrenched, you know, families are in that church and that community. So you have to be cognizant of those things as you go into those areas. But for the burnout and for the purpose of what we're talking about today, one of the things that we found with these pastors was that two things. Number one, I think that is very, very key is whenever they walk through difficulty, they had the perspective of it's not always going to be like this. That was one thing that was consistent with every single one of them. And when I asked them, what do you tell yourself or what do you think about when you walk into a very difficult time in ministry? And every one of them, they worded it differently. But ultimately, what they said was, it's not always going to be like this. So I've got to put my nose to the grind. I've got to get through this. I got to keep putting one foot in front of the other because I'm going to walk out of this on the other side. And I think that that's one thing that builds longevity because other pastors get to that point and say, it's always going to be like this. They're never going to follow me. Uh, the culture's never going to change. And so they just keep going from place to place, looking for a place that fits them in the beginning instead of giving people time to learn them as their leader and to follow them as leader and for them to build a culture over time of what vision God has given them for that church. That's interesting. Um, so perspective had a lot to do with it. Really an optimistic perspective versus a, a pessimistic perspective or, or a negative perspective of the future. That's exactly right. Yeah. And, and you know, ultimately uh, you should expect trials and tribulation. Every single one of these pastors had a crisis around year five, some of them a little earlier, some of them a little later, every single one of them, whether they started the church or whether they walked into a church that had been there for, you know, a hundred years before them, um, they all said there was some kind of crisis that they walked through at that time. And it was amazing because they said it wasn't really until after that crisis that their most fruitful ministry came. So it's almost like you're building the right to become a pastor and then when you walk through a crisis with the church, they go, okay, this guy's with us. He, he really is here and he's walking. He didn't run from this and he walked through this difficult time. Now, all of a sudden, you know, they're ready to, you know, as the old cliche goes, they're ready to charge hell with the water pistols with you because they see you as their pastor. And then the most fruitful ministry comes. So think about that, Josh. If that's true, then so many pastors that go from church to church never see their most fruitful ministry because they don't stay long enough. And part of the reason they don't stay long enough is because they never learned to rest while they were there. Yeah, that's good. That's 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 good. Um, So rest, obviously, a a big key to that and the longevity of that, Uh, an an optimistic outlook, an optimistic perspective, which I think rest brings, I think when we're tired, when we're exhausted, when we're worn out, it's hard not to look at things with a bad attitude. It's hard not to look at, be a, become a pessimist about everything because we're, our brain's just not working the way that it's supposed to be working. And our heart's right. probably not working the way that it's supposed to be working uh, if we're not getting the rest that we need, uh, both spiritually and uh, physically. Um, so, so along with that perspective, what were some of the commonalities that you were seeing with some of the most successful pastors? And, and you really talked to them, I mean, the, the people that you were talking to for this dissertation, I mean, these were, these were churches of very, or pastors of very large churches. A lot of them had been there for over 30 years. Uh, and and yeah, some of and, these and names are names that we would probably recognize. They would absolutely be names you recognize. And here's the thing that's interesting, because at this point, some people are already turning their ears off going, well, this doesn't apply to me then because I'm not at a large church. And it's much easier for pastors at larger churches because they have this whole staff and they can run everything for them. But here's what's interesting. I would say of the 20 pastors that I talked to, at least 15 of them said, 
that they started in much smaller churches. They started, and, and some of them, I would say probably at least eight of them, eight of the 20, the very church that they were in that is now considered a mega church was not a mega church when they got there. Okay, so it's not like only this only applies to people who are pastoring large churches right now. These are people who, when they started 20 years ago, it was a small church. So it is where a lot of pastors are today and where a lot of pa pastors want to see their church go, which is they want to see this healthy growth that happens there. And um, so many of them, number one, have to understand that they started smaller and got bigger. Um, the other thing is to understand, we, we know through statistics that pastors of larger churches actually work more hours than pastors of smaller churches. And that's just across the board, um, hour wise. And if you, you think about that, yeah, it's a bigger church and yeah, they have a more staff, but it's kind of like more money, more problems. It's like most staff people, more problems because you do, you have all these personalities that you're dealing with. And now not only are you leading a church and many people that demand your time, but you're leading a staff that now demands your time and you still have your family and yourself and your own health. So your, your responsibility has grown, not shrunk in those situations. Well, and that's one of the things that you pointed out in your dissertation is that one of the biggest stressors for pastors was their staff. Yes. Uh, oh, yeah, and, absolutely. And I think didn't that come before even their congregation? It really did. Yeah, the most difficult thing that the, I asked them, what causes you the most stress in ministry? And it wasn't, a, I mean, an overwhelming like consensus, but it was a majority said, my staff causes me the most stress. And they didn't mean that in a negative way, but what they mean was um, they hired people that are different than them and that's wise. But when they're different than you, uh, you have to spend time with them and build a relationship with them and help them to understand what it is that you expect of them, what their ground rules are, what the expectations are, and that, that takes time. And sometimes they're going to make mistakes. And guess what? It, it reflects on you. And so you've got to go and take care of that. Or you've got to come and kind of undergird them because they've made the wrong group of people mad. And so you've got to go and kind of build some bridges back where they've torn some down. So, yeah, it causes a lot of stress. But in the end, if it's done right, it gives you that fruitful ministry in the long term. And that's where you have to think it's not just what's happening right now. It's what's going to happen five years from now. You hired me when I was 24, 25 years old. So in that 10, 11, 12 years that we worked together, I'm sure I never brought you any stress at all. None. It was none. Uh, but you know, it's funny that you say that because actually I would say, Josh, that you really didn't bring a ton of stress. Uh, you know, there's definitely personality differences between me and you, but that's a good thing. And of course, there's some things that you have to deal with when someone deals with a situation differently than you and you learn from each other. But I will say, and not every church can do this, but at Mars Hill, we've always hired people from within the church. So one thing we never had to do was to teach them our church culture, because these people were already members before they were ever on staff. And that does actually make it easier because they've already been there. They've seen it. They've bought into it. They are attending there when they weren't forced to. And so they kind of understand the culture. And that actually makes things a lot easier for us. Um, even though there's still obviously personality differences. And, and you know, as well as I do, we have, there's maybe two times that we haven't hired people from within the church and, and neither one of those really worked out that well because it, they were very different in the way that they thought about ministry. And uh, I think that that is a key is understanding the DNA of the church and making sure that people buy into that early on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I mean, we built a staff of Gosh, we probably had in the tenure there, we've probably hired 17 to 20 different people uh, and most of them from within the church. And, and we didn't have a high turnover rate. People mm, no. stayed for a long time. Uh, yeah. And most of the guys that you and I hired years ago are still there. Uh, yeah. They're still on staff. I mean, I've been gone uh, what, three years now. And, uh, and a lot of those, those guys are still there. Uh, many yeah. that, that have just bought into it um, anyway and we can we should probably do a whole different podcast on that style of leadership and and, and hiring and building that team um, but what I what I really want to kind of wrap up this is obviously rest is important and you know you have always encouraged and in fact one of the things that you did for us is every seven years we would get a sabbatical a paid sabbatical uh, I think it was like a month off or something like that. And you guys would actually even pay for us 
to go away with our spouse uh, for like a week of that. And, um, and so, and not every church has those opportunities, uh, but they can get creative in the way that they do it. But what are some practical examples or, or ways that you feel like one pastors can get more rest and more opportunities to kind of rejuvenate themselves uh, and then making sure that their staff is kind of taking those same opportunities. Yeah. Um, ideally, what I would say is you need to take at least a day a week um, and you need to take, I would say a week every three months and you need to take a month every year. Now that sounds daunting. Um, like people are like, all right, that's just ridiculous. My church is not gonna let me take that time off. But here's the thing that you have to think about it is a sabbatical doesn't mean you're on vacation, you know, going around the world and seeing sites and, you know, visiting expensive hotels and all that. A, a sabbatical can be you going, spending time at a seminary and reading what you want to read, not, not what you have to read. And that's just as much a sabbatical. It's not that you are taking off and, and going and, and living the life of luxury. It's just that you are getting time to refresh your own soul. And I think that when churches understand that and they understand that he's, this guy's not going out and, you know, laying by a pool every day, uh, but he's actually in the library and he's reading, he's rejuvenating, he's going to some conferences and he's getting some perspectives um, that he hasn't had before. Or maybe he's going to visit churches and he's going to get fresh ideas um, of, of what we could do better here with small groups or with the way our church looks when people come into it. I mean, there's just so many things that can happen during that time. And if you sell it the right way, churches will let you do it. And the reason I say that those, those things is number one, one day a week, that, that's biblical. Uh, let's, let's first talk about the theological side of it. I'm going to try and put I'm going to say this really quickly. Man's created on day six and rests on day seven. So the very first thing God has man do is what? Rest before rest. he does anything. He doesn't name the animals. He doesn't work the land. He doesn't anything. He's created. And then the very next day he rests. That tells us something about how powerful rest is in our human makeup, the way God created us and designed us. And another thing is when God brought them out of Egypt and he, he was making them their own people, one of the first things, the Ten Commandments is, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And so basically God was saying to them, hey, you've been slaves for the past 400 years. Um, now I want you to take a day a week and I want you to remind yourself that you're not a machine, that your worth and your value doesn't come from what you produce. It comes from who you are. And that is from a relationship with me. And so if you think about those first four commands, they're all about our relationship with God. The fourth one being remember the Sabbath day. And so the Sabbath day is like a day to undo what the other six days did to us. And I think that's an important thing to remember. So one day a week, you got to take a day and kind of disconnect and kind of undo what the other six days did to you. Because for the other six days, people have demanded that you be a Greek scholar, a Hebrew scholar, a, a marriage expert, a parent expert. Um, you have to be the best speech giver, speech writer. Um, you have to have the answers. You have to come and be appropriate for a funeral. You have to be appropriate for a birthday party. I mean, you see what I'm saying? Like there's so many different hats that you have to wear. And then you have to take that day to remind yourself, but my value doesn't come from how I performed for six days. My value, my worth comes from my relationship with God. And that day is very holy because of that. It reminds us of who we are and why we're valuable. Because if you don't do that, then your value is based on what you're producing and you've gone back to slavery in Egypt. Yeah, and, that, and, there, and there's a whole lot more pressure on you uh, from yourself and from the pressure that you let people put around you when that's where your value is. Um, that's right. That's that's really good. So taking one day a week uh, consistently, letting that be a part of your regular rhythm is yeah. to making that a priority, almost like an appointment with yourself of uh, Fridays or uh, Mondays or something. No, no, locked off not with. Mondays. Never uh, Mondays. Why, why not? You know, you know how miserable you feel on Mondays after Sunday, right? Yeah. Hey, I'm going to get paid to feel that miserable. 
Okay, I'm not <laughs> taking Monday off. That's not going to be my day. Yeah, now, some I guess people it may back like to what you said. It's like okay, Monday you find out you're pregnant again, and now you have to deliver again on Sunday. So that's exactly yeah. right. So Fridays is probably yeah. a great day to do it. Thursday, extended. Friday, those are probably the two best days because let's be honest, everybody's still working on Saturday. I yeah. mean, you're you're thinking about the sermon that's coming up on Sunday. You're thinking about people that you need to see that you need to connect with. Saturday is a like mentally happy. you're gonna. Yeah, yeah, you're going to be connected in that. So Thursday or Friday are usually what I find are to be the best days for most people. And again, I emphasize Monday. I mean, unless it's just you and you just love it and you've done it for years and it works for you. But I'm telling you, you don't want your day off to be the day you're exhausted. You want your day off to be the day that you are looking forward to rejuvenating, not laying on the couch, but going out and doing something that, that does something for you or spending time with your family, whatever it may be for you. Uh, you you want to make sure that it's a day that you've got some energy to go do it. That's good. That's good advice. Um, so the, the last thing, we'll wrap up with this. Um, you know, a lot of the pastors that are listening to this are probably pastors of small churches. They may be one uh, staff member or they may have somebody else, uh, but a lot of them struggle to think about the, the, even the opportunity to take an entire month off where there's four Sundays in a row where they're not preaching and they feel like maybe they don't have someone else that could step in and fill that role. What would you say to pastors and how would you encourage pastors to begin to, to think about how they could make that happen? Maybe 2021, uh, maybe in, by October or November, they're at a place where they could take a, a, an entire month off and, or maybe yeah. even during the summer and start preparing now so that 2021 can be the year where they finally create a rhythm of rest. Yes. Uh, Rome wasn't built in a day. So you can't turn around and go to your staff and say, hey, I watch this podcast and I need a day, a week. I need three, uh, you know, a, a week every three months and I need a month off every year. You're going to get fired. Let's be honest. So they're going to be like, you, you got to sell them. You got to build towards it. You got to show them that this is important, why it's important. So part of that is being intentional and planning ahead. And that means that, number one, you better go ahead and take a day off every week, because if you don't, the expectation is always going to be there that you don't take a day off. And therefore, it's always OK to call you and it's always OK to ask you to do things. If you don't protect that day, nobody else is going to protect it for you. OK, now, beyond that, moving to that one week every three months. You, you almost have to plan to say, all right, here's what I'm going to do every three months. I'm going to. Um, take a week to do this. And you have to lay out this plan for them so that people know where you are and what you're doing. You have to clearly communicate that and say, here's what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. So maybe for that Sunday that follows that week, so you're not planning for a sermon, um, there's somebody in your church that can do it. You're grooming that person. There's somebody in your church who is capable of getting up and delivering a sermon once every three months, okay? If not, there's got to be someone in your community or someone that you can call in who could do that. That's the first thing I would do. Now, moving towards that one month a year, that's a daunting task. And so what I would do is not communicate that, not say out loud, that's what I'm doing. I would start with two weeks and I would say, hey, I'm taking a two week vacation. I'm going to do it in July. And just just a little hint, July is the best month to try and sell your church on give me this month off because most churches see a decline in July in attendance. People are, their attention is elsewhere because it's summertime and they've got things to do outside and they're enjoying that. There's no significant holidays besides July 4th, which is a weekend that a lot of people do have some things to do, but they typically go somewhere for that one as well. So it's not like a significant holiday for church. There's no big transitions. People aren't going to school or getting out of school. They're already in their routines. So July is the one to shoot for take two weeks off of July and groom someone in your church early on. Um, if you have a resource where you could give them something, in other words, you can say, hey, here's what I've been teaching on and give it to them early and say, here's, here's something I want you to begin to pl plan on. I want you to use this in your quiet time and I'll maybe teach it in a Sunday school class and I want you to kind of work through it. And then you have something that you can deliver on a Sunday. Yeah. And maybe it's not the best thing. Uh, in, in other words, their delivery may not be as good as yours or, or maybe they're, they're learning. 
but people are going to be patient with that if they see and understand a vision if they understand what you're doing is trying to better the rest of their experience the rest of the year and that you're planning to stay there and invest yourself there and because of that you've got to make sure that you're healthy long term people will buy into that and they'll understand why you're doing it so well, I think a key is finding someone and giving them resources to help them take those two weeks. And a lot of our listeners right now are members of either seminary or ministry pass. And those are great resources. There's resources built into that. There's resources that they could purchase. That could be for six week series that you could hand to somebody. And it's basically the starter guide, the cliff notes to yeah. a sermon. I know for me, the first sermon that I ever preached at Mars Hill, I, I think I was still the worship leader then, and you entrusted me to preach a sermon. You were out of town, and I still remember it because it was we were in the book of Genesis going through it, and I, and you made me preach the Tower of Babel, and it was a bomb. It was terrible, but I got so much positive feedback from that. I think because people appreciated the fact that you were giving this young guy, guy an opportunity to preach, and I, I know that most of our pastors, if they if if they just reached out there are probably young people or older people that are just starving for an opportunity to do that. And like you said, it may not be the best thing, but man, what long-term benefit is, is it going to have for your church to be able to have That's right. people in your church? Uh, the structure that scripture gives us is that we should have elders in the church. And, and one of the requirements of an elder is that they're able to teach. So guess what? If you don't have somebody in your church that's able to teach, you have an unbiblical church. Or somebody's not discipling in the right way. They're not grooming people. And I don't say that in a condemning way. I just say that in a realistic way that sometimes we buy into the pastor is the only teacher. And if he's not teaching, then it's not a legitimate teacher. And that's just not biblical. Yeah. And so we have to begin finding those people and grooming those people for those things. And the second thing is this, communicate it clearly. So if you get to the point where you can take the whole month of July off, you need to, during those weeks, send out an email to your church congregation or put it in the bulletin or have someone announce it or do a video, depending on what's most appropriate for your church, that says, hey, thank you for the time that I have off. Here's what I'm doing with it. I've been reading this book and I've been so enriched. I've visited a couple of places. My soul is just getting refreshed with this. I can't wait to get back with y'all. And what a great opportunity. Y'all have been so gracious for so-and-so to step in and he's doing such a great job. And thank y'all for encouraging him and look at our church and how we're growing new leaders. And all of a sudden people hear that and they're like, yeah, our church is doing things the right way. So part of it is negating that perception that you're off laying by a pool somewhere for a month. Like, I wish I could do that. Our pastor, no, you're not doing that and communicate that you're not doing that. Communicate why you're doing it. And then all of a sudden, instead of getting pushback, you've got people encouraging you year after year, looking forward to what you're going to do. Yeah, that's good. That's really good. I feel like we've just scratched the surface of this. And so I feel like there's some, there's several pastoral leadership conversations that we are going to be having in the future with you and, and just bringing you back on here to talk through some of these things, because we, we hit on a lot of different topics that we could dive so much deeper in. Oh yeah. There's so much, so much. Yeah. And so, uh, but, but thank you for sharing that. Obviously the takeaway for pastors is find a way to create a consistent rhythm of rest one day a week where you're taking a day off uh, and then uh, a week every three week every three months and then a uh, a month if you can every year and I think that yeah or to at least build that make that your goal that you're you're looking towards and you're building towards Mm -hmm. and you know that week off in the middle one thing I need to say is don't make it a week off make it a week where you don't take any appointments and you're not teaching that week but you're still around so people see you maybe but you are doing something that you want to do. You're reading a book that you want to read, or you're going and doing something that you need to do to kind of refresh your soul and to give you some, some spiritual food, if you will. That's good. Well, thank you, Jack. I really appreciate it. I think the, uh, the insights are great. I think this is going to be very helpful and practical uh, for pastors that are listening to this. And if you're not a pastor, but you know a pastor, uh, help, help him create this culture in his church. And uh, let's, uh, let's, let's start creating healthy ministries because people are are taking care of themselves and getting the rest that they need. Absolutely. If you don't do it, nobody will. Right. Well, thanks, Jack. And I look forward to the next interview. That's exactly right. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity.